Welcome back. This is The Spin. On May 3rd, 2019, journalists from all over the world celebrated World Press Freedom Day. The questions we are asking today is, what do Ghanaian journalists have to celebrate? Last year, Ghana hosted this day in the capital, Accra. They have since then handed over to Ethiopia, who are hosts together with the African Union under the auspices of UNESCO in Addis Ababa. Co host the question is very, very important. What do Ghanaian journalists have to celebrate on this special day? Hmm. In my opinion, they don't have too much to celebrate. They've had a hard time of it recently between the police and political party affiliated thugs assaulting them on various occasions. If I was a journalist, I wouldn't be celebrating. <laughs> police, I'm not too sure why the police see journalists as a threat. Probably because journalists have to report exactly what they see and what the truth is. But I think there's an element of poor training with regards to that aspect where journalists and uh, police interact, where, where police need to interact with journalists. There's, there's been too many casualties and assaults on journalists. Over the span of the past two years, it's been quite um, grave. The incident with uh, Latif Idris of Joy FM, yes. and he's still unwell. He's not gone back to work. And I don't know what remedial measures have been put in place regarding his health and um, work um, status. There's, there was also the incident with the BIM concerts. There was a Sami K, the journalist who covered, he and Ifia Odo, they were both attacked. No, there was a journalist, Sami K was attacked because he took pic tried taking pictures of uh, Ifia Odo oh, yeah. and uh, Asam Wajan, yeah. and he ended up in 37 military hospital. These things need to be talked about much more, and the police need to be sensitized on interacting with media and press, press men, press but women. One, one would have thought that now that we have passed the right to information bill, is some sort of progress on uh, journalists accessing information or a better journalist, government, politicians, religion, or not so much as we would. No, I, I think because journalists serve as the eyes and the ears of the people, um, it's a very sensitive area for people who may be doing the wrong thing or saying the wrong, the wrong thing. Because I, I haven't seen anyone who wants good publicity being angry that a journalist is filming them. It's always the people who are trying to either conceal something or want to portray a situation as being different. So I think that there have to be, like you said, strong remedial measures against anybody who assaults a journalist in the line of the journalist's duty. Because nobody can come to your workplace and beat you. And for a journalist on the street reporting, that's their workplace. And yes. they should not be touched. That is their workplace. Yeah. I think there's more, there's actually also more doom. If you read the, 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 the World Press Standards, the index, the Press Freedom Index, we haven't done well at all. We have come down four places. We are now 27 out of the 180. We used to be 23 last year. And that is one journalist has been killed. We have had a lot of journalists brutalized on the streets. We have had a whole investigative team hiding from politicians, citizens, people they have named in the, uh, the Ghanaian soccer, you yeah. know, corruption yeah. uh, 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 thing. And yet, we are told that journalists must cel cel celebrate, you know, Freedom. And this very team for which they are even celebrating for elections and disinformation. We've just saw, so we saw what happened with the elections. With the referendum. And the referendum yeah. and the elections in Iowa. So yes. How journalists were, you know, treated and, and things mm -hmm. like that. What does this mean for democracy in Ghana? How would we say we are making progress in this? It's a step backwards. It's definitely a step backwards. When journalists are assaulted, it's always a threat on the society at large because um, they have to be respected and if, they, if we want them to remain neutral and report facts instead of creating fake news, then we have to provide a safe environment for them to operate in. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to be a journalist in these times, I'll be honest. It comes in an era where there's a lot of technology, the social media, and each and every one of us is a pocket journalist. So that's exactly. press freedom, if the police are being this brutal towards journalists, it means even us ordinary citizens need to be cautious because you could 
merely make a post on your social media handle or take a picture of someone being assaulted and you could be attacked as well. But what, what about, I think that, what kind of discussion can we also hold about ownership of the media? I think sometimes it plays a role because you realize politicians own media outlets or people aligned with oh, government, yeah, yes, or yes, government yes, yes, owning me. Does that? Do you think that impacts on gen, the work of journalists? In, in, in <laughs> Does in it way? change the truth? That's what I'm. Yeah, the truth. Oh, I, whose I, truth? I, 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 or exactly. whose truth? Whose truth whose does truth, it become? I when you when you say that, who's like? It, it can those, change. What about those dynamics? The direction, bias. the perspective, the bias of the truth. Mm. But I don't think being assaulted, journalists being assaulted, which is what we are talking yeah. about has much to do with the ownership of the media houses. Okay. In fact, yeah. if that had a role to play, then certain journalists who are working for media houses <laughs> that are owned by members of the ruling party okay. shouldn't be assaulted, but yeah. it's not happening. Yeah. It's, free, it's fair game. But how I about think it's politicians using their media outlets as platforms to that's, attack that's journalists? pretty much to and attack journalists? Yes. To attack journalists oh, or I know endanger, yes. endanger their lives, or doesn't that also mean that, and all that impacts the rankings and all these things that no, we, we that's specific you see. example yeah, you are giving. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's wrong. It's totally yeah. that wrong. That is wrong, and I that's a certain totally MP as well, yeah. isn't it? That's, yeah. that's totally wrong. Plus, we are still apprehensive about the killing of the journalists. I don't think the police have been able to. There's no ruling. I haven't heard. I haven't what, heard. I haven't much. also heard. You hear it on the news. What happened with the case with Ahmed Swali? No, that's, but that's what <laughs> that's what we're just saying. We have any no idea. Any culprits as yet? I think no. there there were some people who were apprehended, but later okay. they said the wrong people were arrested. But then other people, I think in the area or the vicinity, seems yeah. to know. They seem to know who these people were, or people they ostensibly saw days prior to the guy being, you know, yeah, murdered. murdered. So. I don't know. But yes, these Ahmed Swale's family members made some strong statements on the radio I heard, and they were not happy with the police handling, but I haven't actually followed yeah. closely the case. Well, the police need to avail themselves. They are under a lot of pressure, and they're under the microscope lately, so they need to behave themselves. And is it Pips that's responsible for <laughs> police behavior? Yes. I think so. Yes. 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 So perhaps... We should be looking at the mandate of PIPs and who's responsible, what their measures are, even though is it, it's, it's, it's an internal they have inter arrangement. Internal, internal, yeah. internal, internal okay. Yeah, we need internal to sanctions, internal which sanctions. we are not privy to. But, oh. um, but I mean... So the, the journalists, there were three Ghanaian Times journalists who were assaulted this year, sometime yes. in March in when Kimbu. they were going in Kimbu. What has happened to that case? The police officers who were responsible, have they been held, um, brought to book? Or is an internal, internal? I think it was the last I heard was being uh, investigated internally. Internally. Oh well. I think a lot. We hope we <laughs> hope that these, these issues. When they say internally, no. sometimes you are not very comfortable. We are not comfortable yeah. about. That, we have been no. discussing the lack of protection for journalists in Ghana, and how this has helped, or in this case, not helped Ghana in achieving better rankings during the World Press Freedom Day on May 3rd. We are hoping that. All the pending cases will get resolved by the police and going forward we shall see some action depending on the team as we go into elections in 2020. We will be right back after the break. Welcome back from the break. I am Elizabeth Olympio Emmanuel. The General Secretary of the Trade Union Congress, TUC, says the total population, working population of Ghana is 13 million. Out of this number, only 1.2 million are in the formal sector. Out of this number, only 80% of pensioners will be earning 1,000 Ghana cities monthly after haven't worked well over 40 years in service. Talking about this today with us is a civil engineer and labor AGR consultant, Engineer Ben Arthur. Engineer Ben Arthur, you're welcome to Captured by Women. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yes. Welcome to Captured. 
<laughs> That's a great. Genuine welcome. Yeah. It is. It is indeed. <laughs> we are very warm people. Yeah. So, the government of Ghana employs about 600,000 of this number, 1.2 million. And more than 80% of all government revenue is spent on the remuneration and conditions of service of those in this group. So government doesn't seem likely to be able to do much from the fiscal side to change the lot of these pensioners. Is that correct? Uh, in a way, yes. And in other respects, no. Okay. Uh, in the sense that, in fact, from the figures that you're churning out, I believe that the last count of government workers give us about 800,000 plus, not 600. So we're talking about 800,000 plus. They constitute about 6% of, according to Ghana Statistical Service Living, uh, Living Standard Survey, around 6. It gives us 86% of all workers in the informal sector, a uh, little over 5% from the public sector. The rest are in the private informal. So that is what we have. Just to paint, uh, give us a sectorial, more or less, picture for us to situate what we're going to discuss in its proper context. So when we talk about former workers in Ghana, they are barely 14% you know, of all the workforce in Ghana. And then if you look at the workforce as to our population, Mm -hmm. About 36% of Ghanaians are able to work or they are of the working class qualification. That is 16 years and above. 16? Yes, 16. That's the ILO definition, 16 years and above. If you are under 18, you will need some capacity backing from parents and the rest, but the working age is from 16. So, engineer, let me ask this question. When we hear about pensions, um, it's you are going to grow old, yeah. and then you cannot work, and then you would need some money. Yeah. But pensions traditionally have always been what we associate with people in civil service and public mm -hmm. sector and yeah. you know structured formal sector. So over the years, that's how we are seeing pensions. But increasingly, I think there's a big call for people in informal sector to, to join pensions and all that. So can you just break it down? Like, what is formal pensions? Who are those from informal sector? And why is the money so minimal for the two who try to join the, the scheme? Well, uh, for the formal sector, if people are complaining not people, if that's the situation. The situation is that uh, not enough money or adequate, let me use the term, adequate money is given to those who are on pension. I'm saying this because we relate the amount of money, the, the benefits they get to what they need to exist. So everybody knows that the pensions we give in this country are woefully inadequate. Okay. But it has its own root causes. And one of them is that we are also not producing enough. In fact, any wages or salaries paid to anybody, which is not matched to productivity, I call it evil. So there's a matching principle. I always use an example. Let me give you an illustration that we have a factory. We are producing just three of these uh, cups. But you are the MD or you are the messenger, and you want to be given a vehicle maintenance allowance, that is 200 Ghana CDs a month. Meanwhile, our monthly profit is about 180 Ghana. You realize that, yes, that's what you need to keep your family all right, but that is not sustainable. So it means that we are not having enough sustainability in the system in order to pay people enough so that when they go on pension, they will have enough or adequate earnings. So that is where we have the whole issue. Coming back to the informal sector, I would like to give us some kind of statistics. I always want to put things in context. The ILO Global Report on Pensions and Coverage gives 68%, that's globally, as people who are out of the working age, those who are old, in their old age, covered by pension. Mm -hmm. That's 68%. In developing countries, 
is 20 percent. Now here we are as a country, we want to alleviate poverty. We want to make sure that the, the bracket for vulnerable people is, is, is limited. We don't have many people you know, in that bracket. But pensions is one way of protecting people socially. So if that is the way forward, then the coverage of 20% is very minimal. And it is stemming from the fact that we have almost 90% of all workers in Ghana in the informal sector. Coming to the informal sector, there's close to 10 million people then, more than 10 million in yeah, the informal sector. That's right. Is it perhaps the approach by the SNIT, by the pension scheme that is looking more, because you, as you say, mandatory and obligatory, perhaps the education aspect has to go from the beneficial part where they say, if you contribute this amount in your old age or when you are no longer active, this is what this can do for you. And it needs to be practical as well, because if you're going to be contributing to a scheme for 40 years, and at the end of 40 years, it will not even pay your rent. You, you, at the end of it, you, don't even, you can't even buy a house because you don't have access to a mortgage to be paying monthly to have that house after 40 years of active service as yours. You have to move from your place of work after 40 years to your village or your grandparents' home and stay in a room there. <laughs> Yes, these are the realities, no, of, are the realities. of the people who yeah. are under the 1,000 Ghana CDs bracket a month. It's a wife, a child, a th or two or three children, education. Oh, yes, more wives. <laughs> Those with more wives yes, should be lashed. Wives. <laughs> the wives should be. Yeah, more wives, more That's children. That's an interesting but, statement. No, it's true. Yes. More wives, more children. I, I get Eliza's yes, point, but yeah. yes. can I ask a but question? How does Let's, that communicate in give less us, pensions? Give us a, a, a <laughs> practical the, scenario. The people in the informal sector, yeah. do they actually want pensions or they are happy the way they, they, they are? They, they want pensions. They've but not been given the benefits of pensions. Uh, let, 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 let me help us here. Uh -huh. Since the... Uh, the promulgation of Act 766, that is the national pensions law, it gave room for everybody, even if you are doing a piecemeal work, yes. to be able to make contributions. Yes. Only that people have not taken advantage of it. When I said multi-tier, we have the basic mandatory, which goes to SNIT, and normally is from the former sector yeah. workers. That is the public and the private former service. Uh, former sector workers. And then we have the tier two. The tier two mm -hmm. is the occupational mandatory scheme. And it is not collected by SNET. Yeah. What it means that you pay Choose that, you know, it's also mandatory. So as you pay, you're able companies. to accumulate some wealth because it will be given to you as a lump sum. You can use it as a collateral to get land, to acquire property. Uh, if you're a taxi driver, so what, let's has, be yes. what has the no, take up No, I'm being realistic been, because you know. it's mandatory. Yeah. What has and the take up been on the tier two? When you say the take up, has it been, you, have a lot of people signed up? Oh yes, a lot of people. In the informal yeah, sector? It's, it's mandatory. That's why they take 5% mm -hmm. yes. of your earnings. Yeah. And then the employer adds 13 and a half. That, that is making 18 and a half. So at the end of the day, the mandatory scheme is there which is the basic one. And there's a, a second one, which is also mandatory. The informal sector <laughs> is the tier three, and it's a voluntary contribution. The fact that it's voluntary does not mean that you don't have to do anything about it. Okay. So even in those, uh, for those who are in the formal sector, they can still make voluntary contributions. Yeah. And it's a yes. lump sum. So if you are earning, let's take a carpenter. I want to always yes. use examples. I love an In Ghana, the minimum pay everywhere that minimum we give wage, to yeah. the not the national minimum the minimum wage that we give to a carpenter on daily basis 50 is 60 CDs. is 50 60, 50 Ghana. CDs, yes so just imagine you have earned this amount for say 15 working days in a month in a month what stops you from That's giving realistic. 40 Ghana because if you take the average Great. that people pay so even as their pension you have to snake that's the, the, the average for those in the low income brackets you know, area. Mm. So, what stops you Engineer as Arthur, a carpenter? You have 40 for, CDs. For, for, yes, a 40 month. CDs a month. In 12 months, that's 480 CDs. Yes. In how many years of and working then let's service? Say, let's say 20 you, years, yes, let's say you'll be working for 15, 20 years. Okay. Add so, it. 480 by uh, 20 years. Yes. 9,600. 9,600 9, or 9,600? 9,600 9, CDs. Yes. After you have Work 20 That's 20 years. years. Is that the figure you got? 9,600. So if you have 9,600, 
this is the magic. In 20 years time, no, the when prices would have escalated. No, <laughs> because it's not only you yeah. that that is making this contribution. It's a collective. And then it's invested. Do you get yeah. it? Ghana has more or less a collective All contribution. Right. It's not an individual contribution. Okay. These it's are the scenarios app that need to be given no, I need, to I people. I need to whet the appetite of those who are listening. Exactly. It's, it's so a collective, let us get there. Mm. It's a collective contribution. Mm -hmm. And you don't expect mm -hmm. that. This money, as soon as you contribute, will be sitting down there in its nominal value. Waiting for you. It is to be invested. Yes. Okay. So once, it's just like if you bought a, a plot of land at 9600 in the next five years, it's not going to be so. Okay. The value will appreciate. So what does so someone who is investing, it contributing 40 CDs a month, what is the person, this is going to be a broad... I, I would not be able to put, before you land, I would not be able to put a value on it here. An expectation. Oh, of course. If you are, so if, 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 this contribution goes to, if this listeners. contribution goes to SNIT, at least you will be among the brackets of the 350, 400 a month. A month. It's better than living on nothing. And okay. be careful, when you age... There are certain basic requirements that you need it most. Housing. Housing. You know, we Crucial. the young ones, we Medication. can afford. Medication. You know, we Medication. can afford to move. Housing and health. Okay, go, engineers you know, and health. Go out, but presently, um, housing is not And then offered. your health needs. My excitement was the calculations that yeah. Liza made sure yes. of David. Now, you will have 9,600 or something more. No, no, I mean, it, it will accumulate. It would have been invested and be a bit it would have money. grown. All over the world, people chop pensions. You know that, right? When you say people chop it, they chop it. They miss it. It's mismanaged. Okay. It is, we don't know where the money is. Pension I don't even really want to start with our own scenario. You know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Workers, especially this year, are saying that they are talking about sustainable pensions as the theme and all that. But people are not amused because people don't think they are getting value for the pensions that they have been contributing to all these years. You would hear that your pension has been invested. What's the mandate that goes with that? If, I, if, if contributions are taken from me, which are taken from me, and then tomorrow I hear that my, my money has been used to build housing for some other people to go and stay, and my money has been used to mm -hmm. invest in this and that, you know, kind, what's the mandate for a pension body like SNET, for instance, to use the money to do that, or indeed to buy equipment for the office, or to buy software, as you know where my, my, I'm drifting towards. What does it mean for a pension organization like SNIT to do some of the investments that they do? Who mandates them? SNIT has an obligation, and it's a twin obligation, to ensure that the pensions of contributors or members of his scheme are secured. So despite the fact that it, it, it ought to build and protect its members in terms of providing accommodation for them, it is also mandated to make sure that it has used the pension funds profitably. So you will hear SNIT build buildings or housing units, but its contributors are not benefiting. It's all because the contributors are not earning enough to match up to the capital, sorry, the market prices of some of these facilities. And we need to put it in perspective. Again, SNIT, by the obligations of state, is supposed to keep the basic mandatory funds, that's the contribution from the tier one. And what they do is that they must make sure that that money does not occur in accidental forms. When I say accidental forms, you have kept your money somewhere. The next time somebody tells you that it was spent on this, yeah. we use it for this, it's no longer available. So SNIT is the one keeping that amount of money secured which is not even accessible to you for your use or misuse. But the tiers two and three gives you the flexibility. So if you want to buy a vehicle and you want to use your lump sum as mm -hmm. a guarantee, that one is allowed. The law came into being with the background of our informality. Because a lot of people do banking, but they don't have collaterals in its proper forms to procure certain services. So once you have your pension contributions available in the forms of TS2 and 3, you'll be able to do that. But the question here is, are we also mandated to ensure that those who are in the informal sector, when they also retire, are socially protected 
or they have adequate earnings for their upkeep? The answer is yes. The fact that they are in the informal sector does not mean that we must ignore them. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the time has come for us to amend Act 766, that's uh, the Pensions Act 2008, to ensure some kind of, you know, compulsoriness, I mean, a compulsory nature in their contribution. The, the voluntary aspect is okay, but if the person grows up and becomes a liability on society, it's our joint responsibility to, to ensure that that individual is, is maintained. Why must we give enough flexibility to the person to decide whether when I grow I should be vulnerable or not vulnerable? So I think that the time has come for us to ensure that some kind of uh, imperative is included in the law to ensure that even if you are doing your own work with only you as an employee and an employer, you are mandated to make some minimal contributions. contributions. Uh, in the mm. what about uh, uh, student loans? I hope I've not dumped in your student loans. <laughs> <laughs> Me, my, my, my point now is just about, you know how we used to have these um, loans, uh, Senate loans? Yes. And then when you finish, so you, you like, chop some. <laughs> I, oh, I chop some. I chop. But some. you hadn't contributed. Oh, who said so? <laughs> no, I'm saying no. that as at the time you were enjoying it. Yeah, but I have. You no, had not made any payments. Your parents, your parents, your parents, your parents had deal. contributed. You know, they let some people sign for you <laughs> yes. and all. But when you start working. And then they start deducting, yes. and at a point they actually encourage you to come in and you know pay the pay off. Pay, yeah. pay off. Pay it off. Uh, does doesn't that impact your final contribution in the end? Do you think? It, it does, but interestingly, for SNET and its contributions and calculations, there are thresholds. So even if you far exceed the threshold by even five seven years, mm. it, it doesn't make much difference in terms of your calculations and your benefits. Okay. So it's not as if you are taking advantage of SNIT or somebody is taking advantage of SNIT. Yours is to make your contributions. But you have just highlighted to us the importance of contributing towards your pensions. It gives you a guarantee to educate your children further. Pensions yeah. have to be made more attractive. That, that, when that's you the hear the, the small sounds, people like, I'm not going to bother because yeah. I'll it's, find a way to make that money. Yes. It's, it's, anyway. it's a product. It's a product that must be marketed well. But unfortunately... A product we, that yes, must be marketed Yes, well. but we are not seeing it as a product. We are seeing it as, a as an extraction that we must, we must take from people. Yes. It's the responsibility of people. I think it's the if way they do packaged. it, yeah. we like it. If they don't do it, we shall punish them. That, that has been our yes. approach towards pension. And it's wrong. But we must see it as a product. That must be marketed that well. That must be marketed well. Because both the managers of the fund have benefits, and those who are contributing have benefits. Yes. The state gets its benefits. So all of us, we must be attracted to marketing that product and market it very well. Very well. With benefits, the three key benefits, yes. housing, All the social health. partners. Food in your old age. Those are the three key things. Engineer Ben Arthur, it's been great having you on the Thank show. You. Thanks for breaking it down for us <laughs> to the great nitty gritty. <laughs> Thank you for having me. All as right. Well. Thank you. We've, we've had uh, engineer Ben Arthur, civil engineer and ADR and labor consultant talking about pensions on our May Day celebrations. We'll be right back from the break. <laughs> So the BNI boss has been relieved of his post, and according to the Court of Public Opinion, it is linked to a recent publica publication in the press about the three kidnapped Takradi girls being in BNI custody. Um, why does that even have any relation to him being relieved from post? We are joined today on Captured by Women by Richard Kumado, a fraud and security consultant. We hope he's going to be able to shed some light on the questions we have about this matter. Welcome to Captured by Women. Thank you. First of all, we all know BNI, we all know Ghana Police. We are not really sure if there's an overlap in some of their responsibilities. Could you just briefly 
tell us what the BNI does as opposed to what the police does? The, the, the BNI is an intelligence organization uh, in charge of our intelligence as a country. Uh, the core mandate of uh, ensuring our streets are safe, uh, protecting lives and property is with the police. And uh, that's just the basic difference between what the BNI does and what the police does. So would you say that in the case of the kidnapped Takrade girls, the BNI should have come in at all? Or should it have been a purely police matter? Normally, with the intelligence organizations all over the world, the BNI works and the police takes the glory. Oh. So, yeah, so normally you will never see the BNI coming up to say we are doing A, B, C, D. But in this particular case, with the kidnap case, uh, the BNI has been involved right from day one. When it comes to the arrest of the suspect or even where the guests are, it has been the BNI because they are on the grounds who gather the intelligence and the police move in to do the prosecution. And when it comes to the arrest, the BNI can arrest also and hand over to the police because you are dealing with democracy and the democratic structures must be seen to be working. By the security structure we have in the country these days, and that is what is creating the problem. And that is where we are having the kind of issues we are having. When you set your mind back to what happened at Ayawaso West Wogon, yes, you saw the discrepancies and the contradictions. When you have the security structure we have in Ghana today, where the security coordinator, recognized by law, is supposed to be the centralized person, so we could have responsibility. He has two ministers appointed above him. Oh. So you are having the issue of coordination, collaboration, and communication become an issue. So when you take the kidnapped guests, we have a front where those dealing with the issue uh, are not forthcoming or their interaction with the public has become a problematic because information is coming from everywhere and there's no cohesion or consistency with what they are doing. And that is why we have the issues we have. Mr. Uh, uh, let me ask this question. So for a country's intelligence chief mm -hmm. to be fired, what, what's the signal that is being sent. I wrote an article. What, what, what does it mean? I wrote an article and published it before uh, Dr. Pesini also came with his own article. Mm -hmm. What happened is this: within two and a half years or two years, few months, you have two of the director of BNI being fired. They, it doesn't bring cohesion. Uh, it, it, it affects the morale of the people, uh, ineffectiveness and efficiency, and also affects strategic planning because you need longevity to be able to plan something and execute it. Meanwhile, at the very top, because the intelligence sector, the BNI is a key and plays a major role. If you have two of the people being fired like the way it's being done, we don't even know the fate of the third person, and it causes a little bit of insecurity at the top. And uh, it's a very sensitive place, mm -hmm. and even though the man can be hired and fired by the president, because that's what the Act 526 says, uh, we need to be a little bit circumspect how we do it because this is an intelligence chief and his actions or inactions can affect the security of the nation and even governors. Over the period from January to April to date, only this year, mm -hmm. we've had close to 50 kidnappings. Is this a, has there been a rise in the kidnappings or is this the reportage or people are now getting the information out there and there's less than a 20% uh, recovery rate of um, finding these victims? You mentioned something I have been saying for all these years. Uh, since 2008, I have been part of a team that was so keen in fighting human trafficking in this country and across the group. So all over the country, when Madame Patience Square was the head of the human trafficking, we trained the police, we trained the BNI, we trained immigration steps, all the security agency staff. So all the police regional bases and the districts had offices for human trafficking which means that they have the capacity to be able to deal with some of those cases. Human trafficking, kidnapping, money laundering, and uh, cocaine, they run on the same frequency. Now, when they reported a case as human trafficking, remember the journalists who reported the case had shot Ghana into the limelight that we are a country that our streets are not safe, and you raise our security issues. It will affect your tourism and your foreign direct investment. The case should have been reported if I was the one handling it as what? Human trafficking, which we have the capacity already. But you reported it as what? Kidnapping. Kidnapping. And the police hasn't got the capacity 
to deal with kidnapping. kidnapping. So even in reportage, the intelligence service worked closely with the journalists. So when we heard he was fired because he gave an information to journalists, uh, I have been an intelligence officer for all these years. I'm a consultant now, but we work with everybody. Uh, the, the, the shoeshine boy, the Kelly Willie Seller, yeah. and everybody. And it is something they do all the time. If you look at the functions of Daily Guide for all these years, they have worked closely with the police. That's why they come up with stories before the other people got to know. So the reportage was an issue. Then again, we live in a country where there are various reportage of kidnapping cases, uh, the latest one being the diplomat, yes. a high-profile person. The police went in to rescue the man without the suspect. When we begin to do some of these things, it paints a wrong picture. And the international community is here. Uh, the media is also here. And they report on some of these things. So it might not even be we, because if you travel out of this country, the information people have on us is even more than we those who are here. And so you hit it right there. The reportage has been a problem. The dealing with the case from those mandated to keep our streets safe, there has been lack of coordination and inconsistency yeah. in what they say. Is it because the BNI boss is civilian? Because when you look at the national security, they are politicians. They come, you put your person there. When you come, you put your national security advisor, your national, uh, uh, whatever, minister for national security and all that. The police has a structure that, you know, goes to who the IGP is. And we, we all know IGP is it's not easy to suck and hire IGP. No, you can hire. Whatever. The BNI boss is also a civilian. Yes, exactly. But mm -hmm. for why would the BNI boss be taking out on this case? When we saw the shambles of Ayawaso, the sham what happened in Iowa? So I'm not I'm not downplaying kidnapping, but what happened in Iowa? So I think traumatized everybody in this country because we are going to go into elections yeah. in 2020. So are we scapegoating the the BNI boss? No, the BNI boss is a political appointment. He's a civilian. Exactly. He was brought from the research department, just like you have the FBI and the CIA, MI5, MI6. So he was at the research department. He was brought to come ahead of BNI. The security coordinator was the former director of BNI, who is also a civilian. So they've always been civilians. Yao Doko has, is a civilian. Franco Poku is a civilian. Civilian, yeah. uh, they've all a civilian with no, Mr. Who Chairman. To who your government is? No, Mr. Chairman, who is now the security coordinator, was the former BNI director. So I'm saying that his government or the president who hires and fires. So it's government prerogative. You cannot also begrudge the president. Exactly. And he decides who to work with and who, that, who he doesn't want to work with. But in respect of that, from somebody like her who's an insider, we are just appealing to them or that uh, with the Security Council that uh, sustainability and consistency helps at the highest level of leadership and management. And that is where the issue is. Otherwise, the president can decide he who hires fires. And he decides who to bring in and who not to bring in. And so therefore, people can say that what we saw at Ayawaso was a little bit of an issue. And even if you look at the commissioner's report or what happened at the commission, you saw it. Exactly. It's predominantly because of the security structure we have. So and the, the BNI, the lack, they can't the set up a commission. Say so with the BNI issues, we can't set up a commission because of the nature of the BNI no, work you can, or what? You can do it. You can do it. The president has the prerogative. In this country, the constitution is about the president. Exactly. He's the number one. He <laughs> can do anything. <laughs> uh, I even have an issue with the Council of State because <laughs> do they advise the president after he has caused trouble exactly. or do they advise him before he caused trouble? Let's get back to the girls themselves. Yes. What is happening? To the girls. When the Madame girls said... When Madame CID said, been said found. Yes. and yet she is still at post. Mami, no, when Mami, Madame, you mean head of Tiwa. CID? Mami when the head of Tiwa CID Tiwa said, Tiwa. we know where the girls are, yes. and we she are working with other their, their, agencies their to bring them back home. Yes. That word is an intelligence coded word. Yes. Uh, if the girls were in Ghana, yes. she would have said, we know where the girls are, and we are working to send them home. But she said, we'll bring them back home. That presupposes. That the guests are either not in Ghana the or they are a little bit far from home. But I'm just saying that whatever they have done, they might have done a good job. But presentation and packaging are two main issues when you want to get your so message across. I say again, why is she still at, at post? post? I can't answer that what? because it's the president. The <laughs> oh, president so appoints her. Okay. So and like okay. But do you think that there is some, re we should question, so I, don't, I don't know the BNI boss personally, so rather he, yeah. him being hired for it is nothing to do with me. But I find it a bit unfair that he should have gone 
been relieved from post when a woman who promised us assured, and the families were not aware of that no, statement. No, they weren't. She'd not even brief them before making a public statement, which traumatic. was very bad, very, very traumatic. traumatic. That is if the BNI we have boss heard went more. because of the girls. That's what we are saying. If he I went, mean, if he went because of the girls, then actually other people should have taken lead and he will follow. Absolutely. Are you not thinking for the president? No, we are not. We are not. We are just saying that is our why the BNI boss is gone. Then mm -hmm. some other people should have gone you, before the BNI boss. Yes. You are a security yes. consultant. Yes. Yes. There are many instances where there have been breaches of security and heads of these security services mm. do not step down. In they don't other, roll. They don't. Heads don't roll. I have been agitating that heads should roll. Heads and, must roll. And I wrote that article and I spoke about it on no, TV really? and everywhere. Then the BNI <laughs> boss was asked to go. And uh, we must I, have some confidence. I cannot speak in for the president, but I'm just saying that the Act 526 that established the Security and Intelligence Act 1996 talks about who appoints the security heads, that's why the BNI head, the duties of the director of BNI. It is the president. No, we are clear on that. We are clear, we on, are that. clear on that. And I like your point that. about whether the Council of State advises him before he causes trouble or after he causes trouble. I like that. I like that bit about, you know. You are right, so you, you and Kofi, you <laughs> want to abolish so many things in this country. But you know, mm. what I wanted to say is, you know. The president is a lawyer as well, yes, so course. you can't in have a breakfast with him and <laughs> get it done. In, the, in, the, in our country's uh, security structure, mm -hmm. There's been this myth, or what would I say, BNI is legendary yeah. for yes. brutality, for fear, and, you know, all that. Would you, do you presuppose that what has happened could be a way of trying to erode to some, uh, some of other perception, public perception, or indeed? In, indeed. Sucking your two director BNI's in two years. Maybe yes. uh, there's something coming from that quarter's that we don't know about. So you are the security you know, expert. Of course, uh, uh, they are classified information yes. and they are declassified. If you look at the way the intelligence services operate all over the world, it's a secret service. Yes. So they operate in secrecy. And even we who speak about it, we can only speak about best practice. And we okay. dare not speak about the internal operational strategy, which we might never know anyway. Hmm. And that's the way it is. Where do you think there are some infractions or whatever it is. The Attorney General speaks for government, and the BNI is an, a government institution. So therefore, whether they are being summoned to appear before the Supreme Court or Court of Appeal, they have a legal advisor. And there are lawyers who work within the system to take care of some of those things. But it's not so fearful as people see. It. It's like the FBI or the CIA or Mossad or MI5, MI6. We have been in London, work in the streets of London. You never know who they are. And whatever they do, you will never get to know. Not your mother, your father, your sister, you your brother. You never get to know, but if they are relieved of post by the president, you, their questions will be. Uh -huh. So I'm saying that the, the official statement that comes from government, we, we what must we should, be So we should wait for, wait for that. For that. So, so we should believe, okay. do you want us to believe it or we should listen to it? Which one would you advise? The, there's, a different, it, there's a difference between the correct it. answer and the truth. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's hope that, let's pray and hope that in this particular case, you will the get the two. The two. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, because someone, they can someone. give you the correct answer, which might never be the truth. But let's hope and pray that this one will be the book so that you get okay. it done. Exactly. Can I ask a general question about no, kidnapping? Can. Do you think there's been a rise, or is it just that we are now having more reported cases of kidnapping? There's something about been? fraud. Once People can rationalize certain patterns of life. It, it energizes them to commit that particular kind of fraud. So you think like with mm. the rise of Sakawa and all these no, things? No, because we have not been able to deal with the cases as it's supposed to be, then it becomes a justification for others yeah, to get involved them. in the same kind of uh, exactly. crime. That is why you are seeing it. What we need to do as a people is to rise above party politics and allow the professionals to get a job done. We have institutions where has been hijacked by politicians because of the nature of politics we do in this country. NDC and PP have hijacked the Ghana police service, hijacked everywhere. So you have, politi you have professionals whose hands have been tied and they have heavy legs and they are not getting movement very fast. You will have the kind of problems we are having. And that is what we need to say. And because my name is, uh, my said name, because yeah. of my said name, I can say some of these things because Kofi Kumado has been saying it for all this year. So you're just following in his footsteps. No, I'm just saying that we'll die one day. We don't know how we will die. My brother Amen has just been shot. Yeah. Gapua yes. has been shot. Gapua woman has been shot. And you are 
beautiful women, you should be interested in that. But until the state <laughs> arise or the state allows leverage, where politics go to the politicians and question. the professionals are allowed to do their job, we're going to continue having the kind of issues we are having in this country. Okay. Mr. Kumar, your question, then we'll if negotiations up. were to be held right now in retrieving these girls, which agency would lead the process? It must be the police, okay. with the BNI working behind the scene. Okay. okay. It's been a pleasure talking to you. You've educated us a lot. Thank you for coming on to the program, Captured. And we'll be contacting you for more information later. I'm, I'm sure. grateful. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you, Mr. Richard Kumado. Thank you. So we have been speaking to fraud and security consultant, Mr. Richard Kumado, who's given us a very interesting perspective of the work the BNI, the police, and the justice system do. And we'll be talking more after the break. Oh, oh, oh. Welcome back from the break. Considering all the discussions we've had today, which has made sure that this is an action week, yeah, we need to ask, ladies, what has been your highlight from today's uh, program? My highlight is difficult, because I think I had two. Um, I liked Mr. Richard Kumado's contributions about the BNI, how it works, and about the security structure, but I also liked hearing about the pensions because it's, a, it's an area we don't really talk enough about. We think that retirement is far away, but for some of us, as has been pointed out, it's closer <laughs> than others. So today he's given us a lot of food for thought yeah. to, to consider what's your best, your own, it's a very personal thing, I think, pensions. How do you want to be looked after when you are no longer working and you're classified as a vulnerable person? And what steps you can take voluntarily to make sure that your after work life is not worse than your work life. The approach by the pensions, which will be SNIT, the major stakeholder of um, SNIT contributions, collections of contributions, they need to change their approach slightly so it's less um, antagonistic, so they can capture more of the informal sector of close to 12 million. There's only a former 1 million, 1 1.2 million, and out of that, Less than, what, 10% are taking re decent uh, pensions home after 40 years of work. So, yeah, this is something interesting, and um, we need to get the message out, probably get more consultants on board to package the message to the public so they are more willing to voluntarily contribute towards their old age for housing, health, and uh, food. Yeah, I, I would want to talk about the alarming rate of the impunity that is being associated with kidnappings and uh, crime, the crime rate, and to try putting the police into the real perspective that we should allow the police to do their work. And as Mr. Kumada was saying, people who are mandated to work should be allowed to work. The politicians might leave the scene. I think a lot of people are, more, are apprehensive about the current situation because we don't seem to be getting any results from the security agencies. So if they start showing results, mm -hmm. it will be a much better way than sucking people. Yeah. If people are in post to work, I think they should be made to work, to so to, to work. speak, so that we, we, we do it. Because if you do one thing and can get away with it, then you go on and you do it because you know you wouldn't the be caught. And these are serious happen. crimes that we are talking about, crimes that are impacting family and is becoming traumatic for yeah. the average uh, uh, Ghanaian. So that's what I would also say I got from today's discussions. Yeah. Well, that's all we have for you on Captured by Women. Please join us next week, same time on TV3.